Welcome to a Sweet Saver Bible School. Thank you for watching. My name is James Reinars, and this is a clip from a Zoom class I taught recently on the history of Christian hymns, with a focus on singing devotionally. There were several parts to the class, but these clips are just of the lecture portion. More information can be found in the description. One reason why I wanted to zoom into her life for two classes is that I realized that uh, hardly a day goes by where I don't sing, not day, days, sorry, that's not the phrase, hardly a month goes by where I don't sing something of Emmy Barber, month, you know, whether it be in a church meeting or some other setting or just in my own time. And then mm -hmm. as I was uh, working on this course last year, when we started all of this, I was uh, just surprised, shocked how little information is about her and then also how poorly represented or like how how hard it is to find anything really accurate about her even you can't even find all her poems online these kind of simple things you know um so that kind of really wanted me it caused me to kind of dig in a little farther so um we will spend a lot of time trying to figure out as much as we can about emmy barber uh, so I have a couple intro slides, and then we'll sing one of her hymns. Um, but first, you know, we're talking about Emmy Barber largely, almost exclusively, because of her impact on Watchman Nee. He, you know, Emmy Barber was a an English missionary uh, only ever in Fuzhou. She never, she never left this, you know, that that region, um, you know, that province at least. You know, and then she was maybe one of the most significant influences on Watchman Nee, and. Uh, he, he, you know, in, in fact, his anecdotes of her are one of our major sources of information about her life and her teaching and her personality. And he makes the comment that she was one, uh, she was one by whom I have been helped most. She was used by the Lord in a very real way. And uh, she introduced him to all the writings that would really affect him. Uh, Plymouth Brethren writings, Robert Corvette, D.M. Panton, T.S. and Sparks. And then after she passed away in 1930, that's when uh, Watchman Nee began to kind of travel and get broader contacts with the English-speaking wor world. And in 1933, he visited England and uh, spent the time almost like ex primarily with the exclusive brethren. And after that trip, uh, he made a comment, you know, it's, it's hard to find someone who can compare with this barber. That was when he was back. You know, everybody is telling, you know, asking, who'd you meet in England? What, 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 how, what help can they give us? And he's like, you know, I wish Miss Barber was still here. <laughs> that was kind of his, his comment, his feeling. Um, in addition to Watchman Nee, she raised up a whole group of, of leaders at that time, uh, including Watchman Nee, his kind of like class of, of high school class, college class, including uh, Leland Wong, Faithful Luke, Simon Meek. There was about uh, eight or nine of them. Um, and that, that's a big part of her lasting influence is what the ministry raised up in these men through her mentorship. And uh, she also left us a treasury of 48 poems and hymns, which we'll talk a lot about later. But first, let's sing a little bit. Let's sing. I didn't put this on our slides. We can open our, our hymnals uh, to 362. This is um, probably one of the most well-known, beloved, uh, kind of always good kind of hymns, always a, a season. So we'll get into uh, some of her history. So we're, today we're going to cover kind of... Um, the first period of her life, you know, from, from birth up until her uh, first missionary stint in, in, in Fuzhou. So she was there first as an Anglican missionary with the Church Missionary Society, and then after that made a change. And she returned uh, to China as an independent missionary for her kind of second, I believe, 10, 14 years. Uh, so we'll cover just the first part today. And um, here we go. So her early years, she was born 1866 in a small town, small town called uh, Pizen Hall. Sometimes you see it spelled with an R. I'm pretty sure it's Pizen Hall. Actually, even my slide, I have two versions there. I'll uh, blame the books. And, uh, you know, and at, at some point, 10 years in, she, uh, uh, her family moved to Norwich. Her, her father opened a, a carriage making business. So they're uh, in Norwich. And then um, we know kind of from an anecdote, again, if, as much as these anecdotes can be taken as uh, biographical details, this one I think is kind of precious. Uh, we know that she had a really uh, clear relationship and encounter with the Lord around age nine. This is, this is the anecdote from Watchman Nee. A few months before Miss Barber died, I went to see her and spoke with her for a long time. I wondered why this sister had such profound spiritual experiences. I wanted to know the reason for this. I asked her why the Lord had been so gracious to her. She answered, I do not know. 
I only know that I have always been hungry and I have always been eating. Since I was nine, I have always been hungry. And the, the anecdote goes on, but that little detail in the middle, since I was nine, I've always been hungry. You know, I, she was an Anglican, so she would have been baptized as an infant, just kind of brought into the Church of England, uh, in the sea of Christian society. But then at nine, she could say, for some reason, I'm just hungry. I want to know the Lord. I want to have a deeper understanding of him, revelation of him. And that's something she experienced through her lifetime. After her early years, you know, we, we don't know too much about when or why or how, but she spent uh, a fair amount of her 20s in Liverpool, other side of England. Uh, we know she was very involved with the Young Women's Christian Association, even to be like the lady superintendent of their local chapter. And uh, when she became a missionary, she was actually supported by her friends in Liverpool, either through the YWCA. Um, she was the, the Liverpool uh, Church Missionary Society's uh, their their ladies union and then the, the title was their own missionary she was the ladies union own missionary that was uh, how her support came and um this uh experience with the ywca laid a, a very positive foundation in her whatever christian experience and serving the lord and trying to see the gospel be furthered uh these are part of her instructions uh when she was first sent out by the the church missionary society uh the, the secretary makes this comment you know you miss barber I have the committee rejoices to know enjoyed a somewhat large experience in work for the master, which will serve you in good stead in the foreign field. So he's saying he's acknowledging she's had like a decent amount of experience already trying to, to serve and be involved in different things in a serious way, uh, not just attending church on Sunday. And that's going to lay a good uh, foundation for her life as a missionary. But her era was a, a time where there was just a lot of real spiritual revival going on in England. And we've, we've touched this a little bit. This is kind of a summary of some previous classes. We know in the 1870s, uh, D.L. Moody really stirred up the whole country. He had several years of gospel campaigns across the whole country. And uh, as the, the gospel was being spread and people were being born again in a new and clear way, uh, that was, you know, increasing the amount of people who were born again. There was also a kind of a, a sister movement uh, the higher life Christian movement that was bringing uh, Christians into a deeper life with, with Christ and kind of embodied by, by names like the Keswick Convention. This was going on in the 1870s. And Hudson Taylor began his missionary uh, endeavors around that time. And uh, it really challenged the existing established missionary societies uh, for a few reasons. You know, he would hold big gatherings like every other mission society would hold big gatherings to quote unquote, raise, in, in their mind, raise funds. He wouldn't make any public appeals for funds, but he also made a, you know, he wouldn't hold a meeting for his mission. He would appeal for China. He would appeal for the needs of people. He didn't want to do anything that would take, take away recruits from the London Missionary Society and sign them up for the China Inland Missionary Society. So he would uh, just have meetings for China and just, just pray spiritually and then raise and encourage people to go be a missionary for any society, not his. He wouldn't do any direct recruiting in those things. And that really put all the other societies on the spot for how they handled money, how they handled recruiting, how they uh, competed with one another. And it uh, encouraged, um, to, it just kind of uh, put them on the spot to raise the spiritual atmosphere among these societies. Um, with that, D.L. Moody you know, visited Cambridge in 1882 and uh, really stirred up missionary zeal in the, the, the college, you know, the college, the really high level educated college, college class. And uh, out of that, what's called the, the Cambridge Seven, that's the picture of them on the right there. Uh, they sailed to China with Hudson Taylor in 1885. And many of these were very prominent uh, uh, figures in, in the, the young society with really bright futures in business and sports uh, before them. So this just captivated the attention of England, what, what God was doing uh, in these, these men and even causing such men as the Cambridge Seven to give up their careers to go be a missionary in China. And Emmy Barber uh, was really swept up in this movement that was going on in the country. We, we know from her letters that she had a desire to be a missionary in China since 1886. That's around age 20 for her, right? The same time as these things are happening. She writes this in her first letter on the ground in China, her first letter back home. Blessed with good health and allowed to live in this land, a joy which I have looked forward to for 10 years, enjoying the language and living with the people. 
I can only say my cup runneth over. Hallelujah. So you can see there's that, again, that little reference to 10 years. That's all we really know about that. But she had been working towards this uh, moment for 10 years. So 1886 is just part of what uh, so much is happening in the 1880s of missionary movement. Um, so as part of what was being stirred up by D.L. Moody and uh, deepening by the Keswick Convention, uh, and as in Taylor, the Church Missionary Society began a public appeal for prayer that they could send out 1,000 missionaries between uh, 18, so this, this appeal was 1890, and they wanted to get 1,000 missionaries out by 1899, by the end of the century. So they, that was, you, you, know, you can just see this was um, being pushed for from a lot of different sides. And uh, that prayer was really being, being met in a lot of ways. Um, you know, in 1894, we know she trained at the Willows, which is a, it's a training school. The Church Missionary Society had several training schools for missionaries. And uh, she was sent out with a very large group, the largest uh, group of single women that the, the Fukien mission had ever received at that time. Fuji, you know, they spelled Fukien from the, the back. That's how they spelled it. So I'm used to pronouncing it all a couple of different ways. Um, so 1896, she was sent out with a large group of women. And uh, this is this is this is her. You know, you actually somebody has made that little cutout of her picture, and that's what you see in all the books. But this is the original photo of her kind of class with a, a few of the this is in Fuzhou so it's her class of missionaries with some of the older missionaries uh on the site you know one name that will come up with uh later is Miss Bushell this is Miss Bushell right next to her this is the principal of the teach of the school that she will teach at at the end of her time uh who you know Miss Bushell is an older missionary she's been there for uh 15 years 15 17 years by this time um, but you can just see, uh, you, you just you see people's faces, you get a little feel for the culture, the society, what's going on in 1896. I have almost no information about her parents besides their names and occupation. Um, you know, one source, you know, we, we know like her home address from her letters and you, you know, I, there's, there's one source speculates that the, the church right on the corner of that street uh, had a very strong evangelical uh, whatever track record at that time. In the Anglican church at this time, there's a couple strains. There's the high church, the medium, the, the broad church, and the low church. Those are the, the, the titles. And the low church is the evangelicals. That's where John Newton was. And people who think you need to be born again, that's the low church. So uh, the church on their corner had a really big reputation at that time for being evangelical. So it's likely that they would have gone there or been influenced by that. And that would contribute to her uh, just kind of uh, passionate service with the YWCA and all these things. So, so likely. So this is a, a picture of uh, Fujian province from one of their own books. So it has their, their kind of spellings of things. Um, you know, so what, what they would do uh, as a as a as a missionary, a single woman missionary, especially in the first couple of years where they're mastering the language a little bit, they would go out with Bible women. That was the the, the title. It was a, a native person who has spent a couple of years in their uh, kind of Christian education, and uh, that could kind of go with the missionaries. So the missionaries would definitely do some talking and some preaching, but also the Bible woman was really someone from that village, from that area, who maybe knew people better and these kind of things, and could really um, they could be a team in that kind of way. Um, but then they would also run these schools, the schools that were for the Bible women, trained them. Uh, you know, one of uh, schools, I believe the school she's at in the, in the south, you know, um, either at Keng Tao or Hok Cheng, um, you know, they had been there. Um, sorry, they would at that time it was a smaller school. They may have a class of 25 women uh, who would be there for two years. That was the thought. And then they could, after that, they could be hired. It was actually a job. You know, it could be hired with some kind of salary to be a Bible woman. And that was a lot of what they were doing. Um, 1896, she arrives in China. In 1901, she gets transferred uh, to a much larger school. This is the Girls Boarding School in Fuzhou. This is, uh, was founded by Jesse Bouchel, who we saw in that picture earlier, and Clara Lambert. Um, they were from a, a sister society called the Female Education Society, and they had been there much earlier. They had Miss Bouchel had been in China since 1882, and Miss Lambert in 1889. And this is the school that uh, Emmy Barber will work out for the rest of her time. She, she leaves China in 1907. So this is kind of the, she's in Fuzhou, she's in the capital, she's in the heart of the mission as well for the rest of this time. 
it's a large school overall you know i think there could be 200 girls in a semester and this is a boarding school so this is not uh so the the bible women classes were for adults often even married women with the permission of their husband uh, who would go for two years. This is a girls boarding school, middle school, high school, they would live in. And uh, you know, she describes this whole time as uh, one of the happiest in my life. And uh, it's just delightful. I'm so in love with it. And um, one thing I appreciate about these kind of the, the, this time in her life is you really see how uh, much of a foundation, all this kind of constant teaching, not just like basic education, but they really focused on, on evangelization, teaching the Bible, teaching the God, preaching the gospel to these girls, really, really laid a foundation of teaching the Bible, sharing the gospel, answering hard questions. You know, they would ask her questions like, well, what happens to a baby when they die before they're baptized? As an Anglican, especially, she really had to wrestle with that because, you know, that's A, they do infant baptism and she's preaching the gospel to all these not, not infants. So when they become believers, she really sees like regeneration and then being born again and being baptized uh, of their own choice, you know, so she really had to wrestle with the, and this, this comes up later, um, you know, they, they, they would ask her other hard questions. She writes a letter uh, where she had, you know, they wrestled a lot with, say, the parents of some of these children uh, who were, say, addicts of opium and different things, and uh, the real difficult challenges that happened, that, that caused so Miss uh, Barber made once a, made a complaint in front of her class. You know ah, why? What what will it take to convince people to get away from opium? And the girls shot back right away. It came from the Englishman. And she was like, "Oh my gosh, what do I do? You're right." <laughs> so she had to really just wrestle with all the the, the in, impact of her society and, and the struggles it was bringing her. The all all this stuff. They 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 whatever, they didn't mix words with her. And that was a real training in how to shepherd and preach the gospel and use the word and, and how to wrestle with these things. There we go. So at this uh, time, around 1904, 1905, there was a real deepening of spiritual life that was going on in all of English society. And it affected the missionaries a lot. <laughs> One thing that comes up very prominently is actually the, the Welsh revival 1904, that eventually Jesse Penn Lewis, Evan Roberts were, were involved with, had a wide impact. You see this in a 1905 letter of hers. Dear Mr. Barring Gould, that's the secretary back at home, just a line to tell you that the revival has come to Fukien. So she is, this has to say the revival, you know, and there is very much this feeling that there is something going on in England that was spilling over into China. This next line is interesting, though. Though not as yet in our CMS circle, it is coming and we doubt not in our united prayer uh, missions, prayer meetings every Monday for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost has received new stimulus. So she sees a lot happening. That's just, uh, you know, she's reading about the 1904 Welsh revival, what's going on. She's seeing things happen. And we, we know from other things, it's, it's among the American Methodist missions going on at that time. She's seeing uh, unprecedented prayer meetings and people just repenting to one another and asking for forgiveness of the sins uh, to people they've offended during the meeting and these kind of things. And she's amazed by that, but it's not happening in our circles yet. Um, so that, 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 will, that theme kind of comes up a little bit too. And then in the summer of 1905, there are a, a lot of gatherings. She even mentions this a little bit here, uh, United Missions Prayer Meeting. This was kind of a new thing at that time that the Europeans of several missions were getting together to pray, a real spirit of unity uh, that was kind of new among them. And then they had uh, Keswick-like conferences. And, uh, you know, around this time, we see a little poem. If you look on the right here, and I purposely have this, it's probably, you probably can't even see it. That's kind of the point. There's this little poem tucked away in the bottom corner of this page. This is uh, a 1905, April 1905, of a, a magazine that they would put out in England as a way to uh, update donors, tell people what's going on, but also, you know, to, to try to encourage fundraising as well. And uh, look at this poem at the bottom here. That God may be my, may be all in all. If the path I travel leads me to the cross, if the way thou chooses lead to pain and loss, and, and many of us already know what, where this poem is going. This is one of her, uh, whatever, most impactful, important, special, well-known hymns appearing in uh, an Anglican journal in 1905. I always thought this was from her later period when she was spiritual or something. And so she was spiritual. 
1905 as an Anglican missionary in Fuzhou. <laughs> so I, when I first found this, it just, it just, I loved it because it just really changes the narrative. I, I, I don't know where I had that narrative in my head. I don't know, but it just really shapes. Something really deep was going on in her, even in her, her 30s in this setting, teaching at the girls' uh, boarding school. Um, this was not some something out of some later experience at the cross. So, you know, we know that she is about to go through hard times with her relationship with the Anglican mission, but this is written and published before all of the hard times that we know about. So something, so, you know, many secrets only the Lord knows about. Okay, now these last two years with the, with the Church Missionary Society get complicated. And, um, you know, Watchman Nee tells a certain kind of anecdote, um, you know, Christian Chen uh, wrote a wrote a short. Uh, okay, one thing I, I should preface, and I didn't do this a lot. The when I did this last year, I, I explained how complicated her biography is because for a while Jim Risky had one book, which the majority of the contents are actually Christian Chen's book. But Christian Chen's book, he didn't publish most of it in English; it's only in Chinese. So Jim Risky published a lot because he found it anonymously and translated it into English. And uh, this turns out it's Christian Chen's work. Uh, so he's retracted it. And now it's not in his current, if you ever get his a seed sown in China, all the stuff from this book is not in this book, but it's not really in print in English. So it makes her story complicated. And this book has a lot of things from her late period. And this book has a lot of things from her first period. So they don't even overlap. In what they talk about. But so, so Watchman Nee, sorry, it was complicated and convoluted. Watchman Nee tells a certain story about, uh, you know, what she, what maybe Barber told Watchman Nee about how things, uh, you know, ended up with her resigning from the Church Missionary Society. This book tells a similar story. Um, basically, it would be something along the lines of, uh, you know, her principal got jealous accused her of 10 illegal crimes. That's the phrase that this book has. And then they, uh, you know, kind of fired her and sent her back to England with a list of crimes. And uh, the one, the Watchman Nee anecdote is a little softer, but basically, you know, there was an accuser, a uh, silent accuser, and uh, Emmy Barber appealed to the conference and basically had like a trial and they wouldn't tell her who was accusing her, but they just kind of kicked her out. And uh, the, what the, the, digging into their, their, what we can find of the letters and the records, it was complicated. The, the other anecdotes are not wrong, but there's a lot going on. And uh, she, she half kind of brought disfavor upon herself, half was accused, half got herself in trouble, half got kicked out. It's a little complicated. <laughs> and spiritual things are like that. So uh, something happened at the 1905 Annual Women's Conference. This is a, a gathering of all the lady missionaries from around the province, you know, only maybe a dozen were in Fuzhou at different schools, but there's people who are several days travel in different directions, and they would come in once a year. Miss Barber uh, was the acting secretary of that conference. Um, it was kind of her first time in that kind of position of leadership. She wasn't the secretary. Miss Barr, the secretary, was on furlough, so this is her chance. This is her first opportunity to kind of I only say that because you kind of see how she handled the, the authority a little later on. It's a new experience for her. On the second day, she is told privately that the president, Mrs. Lloyd, has important letters that, are, that would affect the women's work, and they're kind of being withheld. Mrs. Lloyd is the wife of the secretary of the mission, so he's, he's like the guy in charge. She's not a missionary. She's his wife, but she's president of this conference. So M.E.B. Maybe Barber sees that something is afoot. And these uh, letter, this letter was uh, withheld until the very last day, the last half an hour of the conference, basically. And uh, what the letter proposed was drastic changes to the authority structure of the mission. Who would be in charge? Who would be uh, a, a senior missionary or a junior missionary? How would someone uh, get kicked out or be on probation? All these things were kind of being drastically changed in this letter. And uh, even worse, the wording was not clear. There were two interpretations. One group felt that the home committee was just uh, presenting something they were thinking about and asking for the women's conference's opinion. That was the Emmy Barber's understanding of it. And uh, what Mrs. Lloyd and some of the others were trying to say is, why would they send us this? They just sent out their decision. They want us to just uh, uh, approve how to implement it. This is already decided. 
Uh, and it became a really big controversy. Emmy Barber was outspoken in opposing this plan, but she was definitely not alone. There was a big group against it. But being the secretary, she wrote very prominently about it. Uh, it was her job as the secretary of the conference to send all the minutes of the conference back to England to Mr. Barn Gould and the other secretaries. But she took it even further step. She wrote a very detailed letter and she even in it said, I'm sending you the story of the fight. Now, now remember British culture, they're very um, careful, polite, put together. I, I read a handful of letters and people would almost never name names. Even if in anything named anybody else's name, they would mark that letter private. And uh, I read one letter where even someone was in kind of a problem and it was a private letter. And even then they still didn't mention the person's name. They just kind of circled around it. So probably the receiver was clear who was being talked about, but they didn't, they're just very like careful with this kind of stuff. I mean, Barber very uh, just put everything out in the open, even assume it just kind of uh, mentioning with, without a lot of, just like very directly people's motives they just want their husbands to be the staff seniors. They're, they're just very on the front, not, not polite British at all. And uh, though the, the contents of this letter may not have been found out by Mrs. Lloyd and the others, the fact that it was written was found out. And they sent a letter to England just totally rebuking the whole thing. Emmy Barber not only sent it to her main point of contact, the secretary over her, she sent it to the head general secretary and other secretaries. So she as the secretary sent this letter on blast to just everybody, uh, when before then, all we know, she'd only ever corresponded with her main assigned secretary. That's a, the normal correspondence. She went further. Uh, it's, it's, you can't say she didn't do anything. She kind of overstepped a little bit, I would say. <laughs> she definitely overstepped a little bit. Um, on top of that, that is not her only problem. She is clearly not loved by Miss Lambert and Miss Bushell by this time. You know, her secretary uh, was writing, this is after things have already gotten in trouble. Emmy Barber is back home, uh, kind of, and resigning. The Mr. Barringold, Barringold, her secretary writes back to the Bush Bishop of the province. With respect to Miss Barber, on her return to England, I found that the dealing of conference regarding the question of the status and probation of missionaries appeared to her to be the foe or, or gay. I don't, I don't know how to speak Latin, sorry. That means the, the source, the origin uh, of all her troubles. And, you know, the bishop just replied that that was not the case. <laughs> so when she's meeting with Mr. Barring Gold in England, she's explaining all that happened. And uh, she really feels that this problem with the status and probation of missionaries was the source and the reason for the misunderstanding and the contention. And the bishop kind of knows the fuller story. It's like, well, there were other things. There were other things going on. Sorry, this is blurry. I, I, I could have just typed it up. Uh, in their records, some of the letters are missing, but in their record book for the community, for the committees, they would type up summaries of letters. So I'm very thankful for that. Here's a summary of one of uh, Bishop Price's letters. This is when he, when Emmy Barber kind of opened up to Bishop Price, the whole story, what had happened. So, Emmy, so Bishop Price refers to the strain existing between Miss Bushell and Miss Barber and uh, of the later's desire to continue at the Fujio Girls Sporting School despite Miss Bushell's wish for her to transfer. So that first sentence means uh, Emmy Barber wants to stay on at the school, but Miss Bushell, the principal, wants her to transfer. The next sentence, Miss Lambert on being appealed to by Miss Barber with regard to her qualifications for educational work deprecated her continuance at the school. That means Miss Lambert deprecated Emmy Barber's continuance at the school. Uh, this resulting in Miss Barber being under the impression that some reflection of her character was implied. Miss Barber has now appealed to the women's conference and proposes to leave for furlough after the meeting. So things got real and it wasn't just about the probation and status of missionaries. This, this is about, so that conference being referred to as the next year's, the 1906 conference. This is in between. So. She's definitely stirring up all kinds of politics, fighting for what she thinks is, are the better regulations for her conference. At the same time, uh, her superiors aren't a fan of her as a teacher. Uh, whether, you know, what, 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 what Watchman Lee says, and this is what he has from Miss from Barber, is that they became jealous. I mean, it's hard for me to 
think that she was not a decent teacher. I think that's hard for me to, to imagine. Um, but they are here, they're kind of uh, deprecating her qualifications as a teacher. <laughs> One of the reasons why they wanted her kicked out. Even more, after these letters, what's really fun is you see Miss Bushell and Miss Lambert writing back to England uh, like 10 times about a certain recruit named, named Miss Stubbs, who they want to fill Emmy Barber's place. This is a friend of Miss Lambert. So also, they also wanted Miss Emmy Barber out because they had a friend that they wanted to come and get a job at their school. And uh, there, there's a lot of things going on, right? So I, there's a, I've already listed three reasons why Emmy Barber is getting in trouble, right? There's the proposed regulations and how she handled her secretaryship at the conference. There's Miss Lambert and Bushell maybe just not getting along with her. There's a, a, a preferred replacement that they need to make room for. Even more, there's one. There, there's uh, some evidence that Miss Emmy Barber was uh, not was starting to like fall away from the teaching of infant baptism at this time. We'll cover this a bit more next class. But when she returns to China, several other missionaries resign and join her. And in their letters, we see that they have totally left a lot of the Anglican teaching. They, through the the spiritual summer conferences, were kind of really touched by the Lord. Uh, regarding just following him on apostolic lines. So they, they forsook fundraising. They just prayed for their finances. They went un underwent believers' baptism by immersion. And uh, Emmy Barber did the same thing. So this is a fourth thing going on right now is she is seeing something deeper in the truth uh, of what the, the Bible calls us to follow and uh, maybe even teaching that to her students. That's what one source kind of implies. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, she... Problems were being caused in Fujio in the Anglican mission. All we know in in detail is uh, two things. This is um this is the fuller part of Watchman Nee's retelling of Emmy Barber's uh, testimony, and he writes this in 1926 when he's working on a magazine across the water at one pagoda when when she's at the uh, her. Uh, mission at White Teeth Rock. So he, she's alive. He's not very far from her. He has every reason to kind of get the facts right in this testimony. Um, and this is what he says. We see that something really spiritual happened in this uh, interaction. Because this blow was so great, she wept and cried before the Lord. And this is while she's still in China. This is before, she, before she's left. She considered how her name and character would be slandered from that time on. And she decided that she would not give up unless the committee would, would tell her the truth and give her a chance to defend herself. The more she considered her future, the more her pride would not let her give in. However, in prayer, it seemed that she saw the Lord. The Lord taught her, you belong to me. Those who accused you belong to me. I am the head and both of you are my members. Consider my hands. What difference does it make to my head if if it is the thumb or the middle finger that is hurt. To my head, both cause pain. Whether you are hurt or the other is hurt is a fact. I have been hurt. Why do you have to argue? Why do you have to justify yourself and put shame on others? You may be able to save yourself from false accusations, but is not the hurt done to me the same? Why justify yourself? My child, be at peace. Your future is in my hands. Well, that's a really clear, strong, deep word, touching her pride, just realizing the real shame is the hurt that happens to the head, to the Lord. Whether it's the pinky or the middle finger, it's the head that hurts. So the Lord fully sees all her pain. She could speak out, justify herself, fight for what's really right. It would just cause more pain to the head. So at this point, you know, we can see that clearly she had done some not remaining silent. Actually, she had written letters back to England complaining about what Miss Lambert had done and stuff like that. Uh, at this point, with this word, she kind of learns to take it, learns to take the cross, to, to not cause more pain to the head. A little time goes by, and she sends this letter to Mr. Barringold. This is uh, September of 1907. It may be easier for you to bring my resignation to the committee in October with the knowledge of this fact that God has clearly and distinctly guided me to join an undenominational church in Norwich, Norwich, whose pastor is Mr. D.M. Panton, a man I rank next, next to Dr. Pearson in his exposition of the word of God. 
I shall, when my CMS allowances ceases, trust the Lord for my support. In this way, I will leave myself in God's hand as to return to China. If the Lord wills me to return, as I believe he does, the money will be forthcoming. But she's really clear. I'm resigning. I've changed. Even joining this non-Anglican church just says a lot. I've been rebaptized. I'm a member now. All the, the, the lot, that lot that would be closing the door on the CMS mission. There's no way she can go back. Even more, when my CMS allowance uh, is over, I'm not too worried. I'm going to pray about it. The Lord will take care of me if it's his will. Well, that's where our this this first phase of our history ends. A lot we see a lot of experience in the field, a lot of experience um, preaching the gospel, a lot of experience really working with people who are meeting Christ in a real way, and a lot of experience with uh, just the the tension and drama and politics of a big work, <laughs> and then being brought to just dropping things to really live out the Bible, really live out the Bible. Trust the Lord even for finances. Trust the Lord for His pattern. And, uh, and we see that even some of her real spiritual gems have come out already at this time. There weren't just, it wasn't just like, like just now she's getting spiritual. The Lord has been doing a deep work in her all along. Any questions before we have one or two uh, nuggets with the hope? Well, that's the end of our section. You can learn more about a Sweet Saver Bible School on our website, link in the description. There you can find course descriptions and find out how you can join the next class. And for now, I'll say thank you. Thank you so much for watching. May Jesus bless you, and may we become a saver that is pleasing to our God.